Thank you. So welcome everyone to this session. Uh, we have in this session one invited talk followed by two regular talks. Um, the session is a little bit more on the classical, less quantum side. Uh, so uh, Chuck Tung, sorry, um, Chuck Ting has said he's happy to answer questions throughout the talk, or we can save them till the end. So maybe if you have questions throughout, just type them in the chat, and I'll, I'll keep an eye on the chat. Uh, depending on the question, I may ask it immediately or may or may leave it till the end. Um, so yeah, I think we can go ahead. Um, Chuck Tung is an assistant professor in Department of Information Engineering at CUHK. Um, and today he's going to talk about unified code construction via Poisson processes. Uh, would you like to go ahead and share your screen? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you very much, thank you very much. So I guess uh, I should start. Yeah, thanks. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah. yeah so yeah, so welcome to uh, this talk about uh, the unified uh, code construction by a Poisson process, like a black box approach. Uh, yeah, I'm Jackson Lee and, uh, from the Department of Information Engineering at CUHK. And uh, this talk is based on the joint work with uh, Van Kant and Lanterum at uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, that is this paper that was uh, just published in the transaction in Informed Information Theory. So let's begin. So we'll begin this talk uh, with uh, this standard like picture of uh, channel coding where, uh, where the encoder would observe the message and produce the channel input. And then the decode, and then this channel input is passed through the channel and then become the output. And then the decoder would observe the output and recover the message. So this is just like the standard uh, channel coding setting. And then, but we now present a new way to think about this channel coding setting. So first we assume that there exists some sort of magic box. This box knows like everything about the message and the channel inputs. But it won't share its knowledge unless you already demonstrate that you have some partial knowledge on this message and channel input. And it can convert like your partial knowledge into like complete knowledge on the message and channel input. So what do it, so what, what, what does this magic box do? Is that like the encoder would, I mean, because the encoder knows the message and wants to know the input, right? So the encoder would give the partial knowledge that it's just the message. I mean, the message is the partial knowledge of the complete knowledge, which is a message and together with the input, right? So this, so the encoder would give the partial knowledge to the box and then the box will answer like what is like the message and also the channel input. But of course the encoder already knows the message. So the encoder will just take the inputs and then send it through the channel, right? And then now the decoder has the channel output. And then like the, dec the, the decoder, has partial knowledge on the channel input because the input is, is correlated with the output. So it will use this partial knowledge and then to query the box and then the box will tell you about it's a message and the channel input. And then the, the decoder will just take the message and then output it there will be the decoded uh, message. And this would be like uh, uh, how this like channel coding would work if we pretend that like such magic box exists. Like at first glance, this box will converge like partial knowledge to complete knowledge. This process converts partial knowledge to complete knowledge seems to be like too magical to be true. But then if you think about it, it's really just playing the role of the code book, right? If you know uh, the, the what I mean, if you know the message, then the code book can give you the channel input. And the decoder can also use the code book to recover the message. But nevertheless, in this talk, uh, I will try to argue that this way, of using this box will, uh, uh, to give, will give you many advantage over like conventional, like random code book uh, constructions. So in this talk, we will present a new approach to prove like coding theorem. It will use this uh, result that is called the Poisson function representation and Poisson matching method. And it's kind of symmetric in the sense that like the encoder and the decoder work in the same way. The message and the ch channel input are also treated in the same way. And then the proof of channel coding and source coding are also work in the same way. So there's like a lot of things that are working in the same way. So it's kind of unified in this sense. And then it will give you like sharp, like one shots and second order bounds. 
And perhaps like interestingly, it gives really sharp proof. I mean, sometimes it can even be shorter than asymptotic like proofs. And we can there we discuss like some applications of this uh, uh, approach. So yeah, so first we'll begin by reviewing some like like the one shot uh, channel coding uh, setting. So there's a message, I mean there's a uniform integer from one to L, and then the our encoder observes the message M and output X, and then it passes through the channel PY. Given X the decoder observes Y outputs M hat and the probability of error is the probability that M hat is not equal to M. And there are like several like achievability results for one shot channel coding. I mean, for example, this uh, dependence testing found by uh, Polyansky, Fu, and Verdu that gives an upper bound on the error probability uh, in terms of this L and the information density, it is uh, iota x y. And then this one shot theorem, like looks at this one shot theorem, readily subsumed the asymptotic channel coding theorem. By just letting what this is letting L to be two to the power n L, and then x to be the ID sequence x n and y to be the sequence y n. And in this case, the information density term between these two sequences is close to like just n times the mutual information because of law of large numbers. And therefore, I mean, if R is less than the mutual information, then the error probability will tend to zero. So it means that like, like yeah, this one shot result will imply the asymptotic results, and it will also imply, say, the second order, like channel dispersion of this channel. Yeah, so the, the conventional way of proving this kind of results is by random coding where we generate the random code box C, I mean, uh, 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 with entries like X1 up to XL, IID at random following the input distribution PX. And what the encoder do, encoder will just look up the nth entry of this whole book and then send it through the channel. And then the decoder can use a lot of uh, methods. For example, I mean, the optimal thing to do is maximum likelihood, but it can also use what uh, uh, sometimes like you can use uh, other construction like stochastic likelihood decoder by uh, Yasai et al. And then, like uh, uh, the, the, and also the cookbook, I mean, it can either generate the IID or you can use other construction like uh, constant composition code, but the, like the main idea is similar. And for multi user settings, the, the conventional way of proving one shot and finite blocking result is to mimic like, asymptotic techniques like using random cookbook and using some one shot version of uh, packing and covering lambda in order to uh, like instead of the asymptotic one. So the proof, I mean, most of this proof of uh, one shot setting like kind of resembles like the asymptotic case. So I mean, for the asymptotic proof, you just find like how do you replace the asymptotic argument by its one shot counterpart and then see what it gives you. But like in this talk, uh, we, we will uh, present a new way to look at this channel coding setting. So we will treat the codebook as a box. And this box is generated at random and it supports two operations. So first, uh, uh, this, the operation is that you, you, you give me a message M and then it will output what it will output X that follows the input distribution PX. So this is an encoding function. And operation two is that you input the posterior distribution PX given Y to the box. And then it will output the M hat, the, the, the estimates of the message. So this is the decoding function. So not that, I mean, the, the, the input is not really Y. I mean, the decoder knows Y, but the decoder doesn't really use Y directly. The, the decoder is only really going to use the posterior distribution PX given Y, which is really like the, the, the sufficient statistics if you uh, want to estimate X given Y. Yeah. But the thing is that we really need like two separate operations. I mean, there's two operations with the previous line and one for the encoding function, one for the decoding function. Do we, do we really need it? And then like, can we combine the two operations into one? So uh, in this talk, we will give a general like box that only has one operation. So it is like the operation is what? The operation is you give, you input the input uh, distribution, you input the distribution Q, and then you get a, a sample U following that distribution Q. That's really one operation. I mean, it's just kind of like a random number generator, which I give you a distribution and then you output a sample of the distribution. But then, I mean, it's not an ordinary like a uh, random number generator. I mean, in the sense that what? I mean, in the sense that if you just generate, I mean, each time I give you a distribution Q and then you output a, a, a fresh like independence random variable U for and Q, then this box is kind of like 
pointless, right? I mean, it's, it's just like generating independence, random variable in this step. But if we want it to have memory, some sort of memory, this, I mean, in the sense that like if we input the same distribution Q twice, then the output will be the same, right? So, he, so the, the boss will have not just generates this, this, uh, this like examples that each time independently. So in this, uh, so, so you can see that uh, the box initially can be random, but after the initial randomness in the box is fixed, then everything else is just be functions. I mean, if you, I mean the output you should just be a function of Q. So it should not add additional randomness to it. So that like if you query two, uh, you query the same distribution twice, then it should give you the same thing. It should give you the same answer. So this will give, make, make the box useful for like uh, uh, encoding, decoding, right? Because I mean, the, like, like, like the conventional uh, uh, proof of the uh, uh, channel coding theorem, I mean, you first generate a code by random, and afterward, the encoding and decoding is deterministic. So this is just like this, the case in this box. I mean, the box is initially generated random, but afterwards, how do we generate this U is deterministic. And then we will see how we actually construct this box. So we will uh, uh, first uh, talk about this construction like uh, by uh, Professor Ogamao and myself uh, called the Poisson uh, Functional Representation. So uh, first we define this uh, U bar I and Ti to be the points of a Poisson process with an intensity measure mu uh, across this uh, 12 mu times this uh, Lebesgue measure. So this mu can be any, any like measure, I mean, any like uh, sigma finite measure. But then, I mean, the, the, the picture is like, I mean, we are generated like 2D points in this uh, plane. And then the horizontal coordinate will be U and the vertical coordinate is T. And then we just randomly scatter points on this plane. And now, uh, given this like, like Poisson process, again, and then given a the distribution P, what do you do? I mean, you will first, you would like, find the points that minimize Ti divided by the density of P with respect to mu evaluated at U bar. So this thing, uh, you, uh, and then you will just output the U coordinates of this. I mean, you will discard the T coordinates and output the U coordinates of this uh, thing, of the, of, the, of the point. So the picture is like this. The picture is like, uh, let's say, I mean, in this figure, the red shape is the probability density function of P. And then you would keep on scaling this red shape up until it hits the first point. So in this case, it hits these points are uh, U bar 3 and T3. So in this case, and then you will output uh, U bar 3. You will just output this, this the letter thing you output will be U tilde P. And then U tilde P is just equal to U bar 3. So this is the, you know, the point that you output. And then the nice thing about this is that by the mapping theorem of Poisson process, the points that you are going to output actually follow the distribution P. I mean, to, to, to gain some intuition of this, uh, and suppose like first, I mean, for consider the case where mu is just a uniform distribution from zero to one. In this case, if like P is also the uniform distribution, then the, the, the PDF of P would just be the horizontal line, right? It would just be a horizontal line. So you just Keep, keep on scaling up this rectangle until it hits the first point. The first point will, of course, be the point that has the smallest t. And then in this case, if you only look at the u coordinate of it, then of course it is uniform from zero to one. So indeed, in this case, then you can see that the u coordinate of the selected point will indeed be uniform from zero to one, right? And then you can also do it for, say, I mean, if p is uniform from one half to one, then in this case, then what will happen is that you just select the, the point with the lowest t where the U coordinates is between one, zero, one half and one, right? So it's the same as scaling this red rectangle up until it hits the first point. And at that point, I mean, if you only look at the horizontal coordinate, then of course it will be uniform from one half to one. And in general, this is also true. I mean, regardless of what shape you, what, what P is, then the point you, you, you select using this, uh, using this mechanism will have the distribution P. So this is like, uh, yeah, so this is a property of Poisson process. But what is like what makes this, this this construction useful is is that like I he can say something about the case where if you have two distribute two distributions you will query two distributions then how, when will the the two point selector be equal and where will the two point selector be not equal 
So uh, of course, it will depend on the position of the points, which is random, right? I mean, for example, if the points is distributed according to the left figure, then we can see that both U, P, and U, the level of P and Q, we select the same point. I mean, they will hit the same point. So it is this point U bar three. But in the, the case for the right figure, then you can see that they hit different points, so they will output different points here. So you can actually like find the probability that uh, uh, they select different points. Like, like, like I mean, U to the Q will be the point selected by Q, and U to the P is the point selected by P. So these two are different. The probability that these two are different, conditional on U to the P, is bounded by the radon decoding derivative between P and like of P with respect to Q, evaluated at this U to the P. So for the case for discrete like P and Q, this is just uh, the P of uh, like, like the probability mass function evaluated like of P, evaluated at U to the P divided by Q of U to the P. So this is a, a, a somewhat sim simple bound on this probability that these two uh, distribution will select different points. And then now, and then now we will see how we how 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 we are going to use this Poisson process. So we will just treat uh, uh, the the whole Poisson process as a as a box. So it's a possible it's a part one operation. That is, I input a distribution Q, then it will output the first points that you hit in the Poisson process, right? I mean, this is U to the Q, and it follows Q by the Vatican theorem. And then the guarantee is what? The guarantee is that for different distributions P and Q, then the probability that they, they select different points conditional on P is just P divided by Q, evaluated at U to the P. And from now on, we will just treat the Poisson process as a black box. So we, we will just forget about everything, about the, the Poisson process and things, and we will just treat it as a black box with these two properties. And then we will see that we, this alone, I mean, these two properties alone can will, will, will be sufficient for proving like a lot of coding theorem. I mean, like we will not use like, I mean, in this talk, we will not use typicality of hacking and coupling and anything similar to that. I mean, we will just use these two properties and then just prove like, like all of the results using these two properties. And then like, like it will sometimes like give stronger one short and second order results than previous results. And the proof can be even shorter than like even asymptotic results, like for some settings. So we will, uh, we will uh, first like uh, go back to the uh, channel coding setting. And I see how we are going to do this. So recall that the box can give a sample of a random variable u. But here, the encoder wants x and the decoder wants m. So if you want to have a box that satisfies both of them, we will need the box to be about x and m. So u will be equal to x and m. So you should give x, both x and m at the same time. So what, so, uh, well, what do the, the encoder do with that? The encoder would, would know the message M. So the encoder would query the box using the distribution PX times delta M. So PX is the input distribution that you choose. And delta M is what? Delta M is the degenerate distribution where this like random variable capital M is always equal to this lower case M. So this, uh, this distribution uh, 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 is, uh, represents the knowledge of the encoder, right? Because I mean, the encoder, the encoder knows about x, but the encoder does not know anything about x. Like, I mean, this is what the encoder wants to know, right? But the encoder does not already know x yet. So, according to the encoder, the distribution of x is px, right? Because it, I mean, it's just a, the, the encoder. What's the distribution of m? It's just delta m, right? Because it already knows the distribution. But, but if we, that, let's assume that they are independent. Then in this case, then the distribution of X and M according to the encoder is PX times delta M.
the M that is like we, we let it to be M hat. So which is the M that is returned by the box when we decode the query using this distribution. So now, I mean, we can find the uh, uh, probability of error. A probability of error is uh, bounded by the probability that components of the first query must be the correct probability. It's just a probability. It's likely to be coded by Yasai at all. So here, I mean, that the, the, the bound by uh, Yasai at all actually is, it, they, they give the uh, more or less the same bound for the case for uh, channel coding. But then their, their approach is different from ours in the sense that they use the stochastic likelihood decoder. So a decoder is random, but here, I mean, once you fix the box and everything is deterministic. So we are kind of like having all the randomness in the box instead of uh, their approach where they have like randomized. And later on, we will see like like that that like our approach has some advantage. Yes. Yeah. So so like like back to the the the, the image of the of the of in the first slide. So so the so now I mean the, you can think of this this, this setting as like the message the, the box has like all the uh, the information about M and X. But uh, uh, how 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 would the encoder use it? Is that an encoder would? Uh, at the encoder no x, and the, and and then the message box, the, the magic box will answer like what is m and x, and then the encoder will send x, and then the decoder say that I believe that x follows p x given y, and then you will input this distribution to a box, and then the box will tell tell the the decoder what is x and m, but it might not be the same. It's exactly the same, so it's x hat and m hat, which is equal to x and m with hyper of b. So so this. Kind
which is, I mean, this function is, is like, like the same way as a function, I mean, the function of, in the Galvan Schinzel theorem. And then now, we will send this to the, the decoder, and then the decoder will receive y. So the, y, uh, the decoder will do what? I mean, the decoder will use its knowledge on you and m, but what, what does the decoder know about you? I mean, the y is correlated with u, so that the uh, posterior distribution is pu given y. And the decoder does not know m, so the distribution is pm is uniform. So in this case, uh, the decoder will query the distribution using this distribution and get u and m, and it will just output m hat. Then now, and then now, I mean, we, uh, uh, we can find the probability of error by the Poisson matching lemma, and it's just this ratio. This ratio is evaluated as this uh, uh, L times this, this to the power, uh, uh, this uh, information density between U and S minus and information density between U and Y. And yeah, of course, we have, uh, I mean, I mean we, we actually need this minimum of what, between this and one here, I mean, so that this, this bound won't be trivial. And this, I mean, of course, this, this minimum and between this and one can be taken because this is a power BD, so it's of course power of bound by one. And then, yeah, so so this proof, I mean, this is this this bound actually is actually like like better than the previous one shot bound, and it recover uh, uh, the best no second order result that is by Scarlet, which is with us now. Yeah, but but, but uh, the proof by Scarlet. Uh, is uh, uh, a bit more complicated, so it uses uh, constant composition code. But here we we don't really use any complicated like code constructions. I mean, the, the, this this slide is is really the whole the complete proof of this result. So it's like really really short, and it is also a one shot shot result. So it is it did not only give you second order, but it only also give you one shot result. And now. And now uh, we will see uh, uh, the, this, that this technique. I mean, we will uh, uh, try to use this technique also on uh, source coding settings. So now uh, consider the uh, lossless source coding setting where the encoder will observe x following px. And then it will encode it into the integer m from 1 to l. And then the decoder will observe, will observe m and then recover x hat, and we want x hat to be equal to x with high probability. So, what, so, what, so uh, and then we want to use this box to construct the coding scheme. So, what will we do here? Is that now, I mean, again, I mean, because the encoder wants to know m, the encoder wants to know x, and so we, if we want to satisfy both of them, we should have a box that is about x and m, right? And then at M, at PM, it will be a uniform distribution because like we expect, I mean, the, the optimal thing to do is to have the M that is approximately uniform. Right? So you just let PM to be uniform. So what the encoder do is that the encoder know X. So what is the distribution of the encoder uh, the, of X according to the encoder is delta X. And what is the distribution of M according to the encoder? Because the encoder does not know M yet. So the distribution is just a uniform distribution. And then you will query the, the box using this distribution and then get M. And then the decoder will query the box using the distribution px times delta m, right? I mean, the decoder does not know m. The decoder only knows, rather, the decoder does not know x. The decoder only knows m. So in this case, it will get x hat. And then the probability that these two points are different is bounded by the Poisson matching lemma, which is this ratio. This ratio will just evaluate to this expression here. And then it will obviously imply the uh, asymptotic uh, lossless source coding theorem. If we let L to be true, our n L and X will be a sequence X n. And then like if L is greater than the entropy of X and for probability of error tends to zero. So, so this is like, just to demonstrate how we can be used on source coding. So next we will look at a more complicated setting, which is the lossy source coding with side information at the decoder. So in this case, I mean, the, the, the source would be, uh, so source again is for PX. And then the encoder will observe X and then send M to the decoder. And then the decoder will observe M and also assign information Y that is correlated with X and it is on, only available at the decoder. And then we want to bound the probability of excess distortion. What is the probability that the distortion between X and the outputs of the decoder like Z hat is greater than D. And then for the asymptotic case where this X, Y are sequences, then this uh, the Weiner and Sip has, has proved that 
the optimal rate is given by the infimum of this uh, i of u x minus i u y, where u is the auxiliary random variable that is dependent on x, and z is a function of u and y. And then, like uh, uh, evaluated on on this distribution, then the expected distortion must be upper bounded by this d. So now we will see how we can prove this a one stop version of minus c theorem. So now again we will have a box about u and m. And then what the encoder do is that encoder query using p u given x because like I mean we allow u to be dependent on x so the Poisson distribution of u given x is I mean it's u to p u given x that decoder and encoder does not know m so it's p m and then it use this distribution and get the m u and m. What decoder do is that the decoder know why. So the decoder knows something about u because we allow u I mean y is dependent on x and x is dependent on u. So, 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 the, so the decoder would use p u given y as the distribution of u, and the the, the, the distribution for the distribution of m because the decoder knows m, so the decoder would just use the this, the degenerate distribution delta m, and then it would get what it would get a pair of points, uh, u u uh, u hat uh, and then c hat. Uh, no, no, I mean u hat and m hat. I mean then then you will get the uh, u hat and then output uh, z hat equals to z of u hat and y. And now we want to find the probability of excess distortion and then the probability of excess distortion between x and z hat. Because like uh, uh, x z hat is equal to z, I mean we let z to be like, I mean we let u to be the correct u and then z to be like the, the, the function of the correct u and y. And then this z and this z hat, because u and u hat are equal with high probability, because of the Poisson matching lemma, so z will be equal to z hat with high probability. So it means that the probability of the excess distortion between x and z hat will be quite close to the probability of excess or the distortion between x and z. Right? And the probability of excess distortion between x and z is, 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 I mean, you can decide it to be low. I mean, this is because, like, I mean, if you if you design this distribution according to Weiner C theorem, then this 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 distortion between x and z will be the greater upper bound by d. I mean, on average, but now, I mean, of course, this one will be about excess distortion, so it's a little bit different, but, but like, but anyway, at the end of the day, you will get this expression here, and this expression will obviously subsume the, uh, the uh, Weiner C theorem in the asymptotic case by law of large numbers. Yeah. So now we have seen some application of the new approach. We can compare it to the like, existing approach. So when, when, like previously, when we compare asymptotic approach, like uh, typicality and covering lemma and packing lemma, like to the previous one-shot approach, like one-shot version of this uh, packing and covering lemma. So the, 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 the one-shot approach, the one-shot like results can give a bound for any finite short length n. But the drawback is that the proof is usually much more complicated, right? So that's a, a, a trade-off here. So perhaps like a reason why asymptotic result is so popular. I mean, every textbook like in information theory starts with like asymptotic results because what I mean because like it's it's it's, it's like the proof is very simple, right? But but the, uh, but the new approach actually shows that you can actually also do very simple like results and also get one short result. So it's like the best in both worlds. But like, yeah, so it's like, it, it looks like it is like better than my previous approach for, for in all aspects. But like, I mean, but I mean, I would be lying if I say that the new approach has zero downside. So as we will say later, then it is like a little bit tricky to approach, apply this, this, this approach to multi-user setting. So like next we will see some multi-user setting, like uh, uh, for example, the multiple access channel. Uh, this uh, uh, in this case, then they had two messages, independent messages M1 and M2. Encoder one observe M1, and then produce X1. Encoder two observe M2, produce X2, and then it's passed through the channel PY given X1, X2, and then become Y, and then I'll observe at the decoder. The decoder would output M hat one and M hat two, and we want M hat one and M hat two to be equal to M1, M2 with high probability. And the capacity region of this uh, multiple access channel is given by the convex uh, closure 
of this region of uh, R1 and R2 where R1 is less than I, 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 uh, I x1 y conditional on x2 and, uh, and R2 is also bounded by I uh, x2 and y conditional on x1. And R1 plus R2 is less than this uh, mutual information between x1, x2, and y. And then we will just take different input distribution and then take a convex function on this thing. And now we will go try to prove like a one shot version of this result. So how are we going to do this is that we have two boxes. Uh, because like now, I mean, the, uh, the, uh, the encoder one wants M1, the encoder two wants M2, but they don't really need to agree on, on anything, right? Encoder one and encoder two. I mean, they don't really need, need, I mean, encoder one obviously does not need to know, know M2 and encoder two does not need to know M1. So, so but the, the, the problem of the box is that the box always give complete information, right? And we don't really need this. So, so what we do is that we will have two boxes, two independent boxes, one about X1, M1, and one about X2, M2. So what the, the, the encoder do is that encoder will do what, exactly the same thing as channel coding. I mean, encoder one will use the box X1, M1, and then we will query like, like the degenerate distribution as M1, and then you get X1, and then it send me this X1. And what the decoder would do is that the decoder would first use the box one, box about x1 and m1, two, and then on the, the, the distribution of px1 conditional on y. So this is the posterior distribution of x1 given y, right? And use this distribution to query the first box, you will get uh, x hat one and m hat one. Right? And now the decoder also know x1 hat one. So that now the encoder actually know a little more about X2, right? Because X2 can be conditionally dependent on X1 given Y. I mean, they are X1 and X2 are independent itself, but like condition on Y1, they might not be independent. So we were X2, I mean, the, now the posterior distribution of X2 is PX2 conditional on Y and X1, and then you will use this distribution to QE the second box and then get M has two. So now, I mean, the, the problem of error is bound up by this expression. I mean, we have two error terms here. And then they will recover our corner points where R1 is Ix1 and Y and R2 is Ix2 Y given X1. And this is a corner point of the capacity region. So, I mean, we can't really achieve the whole region, but it's just one corner point. But if our goal is just to recover the asymptotic result, then this is sufficient because you can achieve any point. I mean, you can flip the row of, of, of X1 and X2, and we get another corner point and then do time sharing between these two corner points, right? So you, so you can get the whole region for asymptotic case. But I mean, if our goal is to have a one-shot version of like uh, uh, of the whole capacity region, then this is not good enough, right? I mean, this is not so later on, we will see how we can do like the whole uh, capacity region. And then we can also do a broadcast channel. I mean, for broadcast channel, then the message, I mean, there are two messages, M1 and M2. Then coder observe both of them and output X, and then it's passed through the broadcast channel P, Y1, Y2 given X. And then and that, and decoder 1 will observe Y1 and output M1, decoder 2 will observe Y2 output M2. And the asymptotic case where x, y, one, y, two are for all sequences, then the, the inner bound, I mean, given by Martin, is given by like these three constraints here. And where u1 and u2 are auxiliary random variables that can be dependent of each other. And then x is a function of u1 and u2. Yeah, and then we'll see how we can prove a one shot version of this. So again, I mean, now, now, now the, the, the encoder. We need to, I mean, we have two boxes. I mean, U, U1, M1, and U2, M2. The encoder would uh, know M1. I mean, the encoder uh, would use the distribution, the general distribution M1 to QE the first box and I get U1. And after the encoder already know U1, so the, uh, now the encoder's knowledge on U2 changes, right? Because U2 can depend on U1. So now the, the encoder's knowledge on U2 is PU2 given U1. And then the encoder's knowledge on M2 is delta M2. And you use this distribution to QE the box and then output and then get MU2. And it will send X is we have a function of U1, U2. And then like decoder would be exactly the same thing as uh, channel coding. So now we will get, I mean, we will get two error events. I mean, we, because they did both like the QE, I mean, to the two queries to the first box and two queries to the second box to be the same. So we get this bound. 
So now we again, we, we get uh, one ton of ton of mutton in the farm. And we are made if our goal is to do the asymptotic cases, uh, it's also sufficient because we can flip the row of like R1 and R2 and then time share between them. But now, I mean, if we are, if we want to prove a one shot version of the Martin Sinner bound, it is not good enough because what I mean, because like, I mean, we can't do time sharing for one shot. I mean, we can do time sharing for finite blocking, but it's usually not a good idea. It will give kind of like, like suboptimal results. So, uh, 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 how how can we like achieve the whole bar, whole whole Martin's region? So the first idea is that like instead of like having the first box, which is about uh, uh, U1 and M1, because the the is uh, is actually like like too stringent to to like commit to U1 by just querying the first box. Because I mean in the first query of getting U1, you are not taking box two into account, right? So you want to be more lenient. I mean, we want to be like less about U1. So a way to do it is that, I mean, instead of having a box about U1 and M1, instead you have a box about the list of U1, I mean, a sequence of U1. So you have U1, one up to U1L, and then M1. So the correct U is just one of them. But now you are not committing to any one of them. You instead you keep a list of them. And then like now, uh, what is U2? I mean, U2. How do you do you query the second box? You query the second box according to the average conditional distribution of U2 given U1. And you average over all, all these U1s in this list. And then you query this, you get U2, and then conditional on U2, you select which U1 you actually use in this list and then send it. So this will allow you to trade off, I mean, between the two corner points, and it will allow you to achieve the whole capacity region. So you just need to to, to change like the, the length of this list in order to like get the whole region. And then yeah, another approach is to generalize uh, the box to give a list of uh, probable points. So I mean the, the it, it, this approach, I mean the, the previous approach about like generating a list, we are still using the same construction of the box, right? I mean, but but just just but we just use the box on the list instead of just one new. So, but it is exactly the same. I mean, you just use exactly the same result. You, you just use the same for some magic grammar. But the second, this approach is that, I mean, we actually generalize the box itself. So now instead of the, the box should not just output one sample, but the box is just output like a bunch of samples of Q, Q1. And then maybe like a potential way of, of generalizing this is that like maybe we can modify the box to give partial information. So now instead of having two boxes, we just have one box, but it can be output partial information. So maybe the decoder one can just just uh, let's say that you only you, I only wants M one that the decoder will only wants two only wants M two, and then they, you don't need everyone to know everything. So this is a possible direction. So but yeah, but I, yeah which is something that I'm currently working on that I don't know. If it was. But like uh, yeah, so. So I mean the this approach of generating a list is somewhat unsatisfactory because like it kind of resemble like the 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 the, the conventional uh, random cobalt generation. I mean so there's that kind of a hybrid kind of uh, approach where sometimes you use for some process and sometimes you use a conventional like like this, like a sub cobalt. But then I mean maybe we we'll, uh, uh, later we will see I mean we will briefly uh, discuss how we can generalize this uh, box to uh, give a list of probable points. So we will actually need the, the, uh, the I mean now now we will need to look at the Poisson process I and mean, recall that is uh, we have a Poisson process u bar i and t i. And now instead of like just using the distribution just scaling the distribution p up until it hits the first point. We actually keep scaling it up and, th and then it, it, it hits the second point and third point, so and so forth. And actually, we actually get a whole sequence of points. So we actually like get one, two, three, two, four, five, and so and so forth. And this sequence of points will be IID following distribution P. And now, if you have two different distributions, you can get two sequences of points, right? And you can ask the question what is like, I mean, if you find the J points according to P. Then what is its index according to Q? So we denote it as this epsilon P with respect to Q of J, which is the, the index according to J 
of the points which is the j at the j proposition according to p and then and then like looks at like like in the previous like what like single outputs like that was our functional representation then u tilde p equals u tilde q is the same thing as saying that this epsilon like one is equal to one so the first point is also the first one the first one of p is also the first one of q and the generalized stuff, uh, for some matching lemma says what the generalized stuff, for some matching lemma says that the expected value of this epsilon are conditional on the j point according to p, which is denoted by u to the p fj, is upper bounded by j times the derivative between p and q evaluated at this point plus one. So this thing, so we can actually like generalize the, the box to give a whole sequence of points. Now we input the distribution Q, we get a whole ID sequence for the distribution Q. And the guarantee is that if you have a two different distributions, P and Q, then the index, I mean, if we find the J points of according to P, then the, it's, it's the, point, the index of this point according to Q, the expected value of this index is upper bounded by J times P over Q times one. And this will imply, uh, for the case where we substitute j equals to one, this will imply the guarantee of the single output form. But uh, but 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 this yeah, but this will also be useful for like our multiple access channel and broadcast channel, and also other settings like distributed lossy source coding, and channel resolvability, channel simulation, and things. So this is this, this result is can can be used in like those settings. I mean, for for this for our multiple access channel and broadcast channel, then we can prove the whole capacity. We can prove the whole capacity region using this. Uh, let me see. Yeah. So to conclude, so we we have like uh, uh, presented like a new approach of proving coding theorems that use the Poisson functional representation for some matching lemma, and give uh, sharp one shot and second order bounds and very very short proofs. And the future work is, uh, yeah, is there a simpler way to apply this method to multi-user settings? Because I, 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 I think it's like that probably the biggest weakness. I mean, for a case for like one, uh, where, where we only have one encoder, one decoder, like, like the uh, Gelfam Pinsker setting or the Wiener Six setting, the proof is extremely short. I mean, it is also very, very clear what is going on. But for the case for uh, a broadcast or multiple access channel, then then we need like two separate boxes. I mean, the proof is still pretty simple, I guess. I mean, if you only want to achieve one corner point, then the proof is also very short. But then, I mean, if you want to achieve both corner points, then it can get slightly complicated, but I mean, not too complicated, I guess, but yeah. But, but maybe there are another approach that can actually do this in a more symmetric manner. Maybe instead of having like two QE steps, that is one by one. I mean, maybe we can just have one step to do both to, to, to get all, all, all the information that you need. And then it will be more symmetric in a sense. Uh, thank you very much. So this would be the end of this uh, talk. So, uh, if you have any question, then please uh, uh, raise it. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks a lot for a yeah, very interesting talk. Um, we you can ask your questions on the chat, or um, you can request to unmute yourself, and you can ask your question out loud if you prefer. Uh, one is just shown in the chat. It says, "Thank you for a great talk. It might be a trivial question, but can we use this for quantum coding theorems?" Um, yeah, uh, the thing is that I'm not very well versed in uh, quantum uh, information theory. So, so I, uh, I think it might be usable there, but, but I haven't used it there before. So, so this might be something that, 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 that we can work on in the future. So I think it, so I think it will be really interesting if we can demonstrate that this will also work in quantum settings. But I don't know whether where, where, where they, it, it, it works. Yeah, I think that's so, a good question for all the audience of this workshop to think about. Um, I don't see any in the chat. Uh, I might just ask one as well. Um, this this Gelfand Pinsker proof was really, really nice. As, as you said, it was like way, way, way simpler than my one. Um, 
Do you know if that also recovered the dirty paper coding result? The, the second. Yes. The, so, the, so the thing is that like, like this coding? approach is uh, very general. So it works yeah. on on like discrete alphabets or continuous alphabets. So for for a case for a dirty paper, so the the source is uh, so everything is Gaussian, right? So yep. so it will all it will be directly applicable there. So it will uh, uh, will get guess. I mean you I mean for the the first order result then you will get it exactly. I mean the the second order result should also be the same, right? I mean I mean so it should, it should be I don't know. I mean yeah, um, uh, I I showed that the second order dirty paper result is the same as if you had no interference. Um, but the proof was a bit complicated again. Yeah, because this second order result is just the same as that in your paper, right? Like, yeah, I, I imagine. So but I kind, you, I kind of did. You, I kind of did you the get the second order results of this. Like, you evaluate the second order result, and you should get the, the same second order result as in your paper. Yeah, it, it should be the case. Um, the it's just in the in the dirty paper because you don't really have a U eventually. Well, eventually it goes away. So uh, I was wondering if it would simplify. I think it should be the case as well. When you simplify your bounds, you'll get the same. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think it should be usable there. Like, great. Yeah. And um, yeah, getting these short proofs is really nice. I was also wondering if uh, you got any like novel, like new second order dispersion results which had never been attained before. Is there anything uh, like that from this method? Yeah. Um, the thing is that like that. If you evaluate the, uh, the 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 result for a uh, podcast channel, mm -hmm. then you can guess a second order result. I mean, I mean, evaluating this thing will not give you anything interesting because it's just a, 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 a one corner point. But you can use the generalized Poisson matching lemma. It will give you a region, and that right. that region you can find this second order uh, uh, result, and and that is something that is. That I that, that we believe is new. I mean that, that second order result, but yeah. it is not very nice looking because it is asymmetric. Because okay. like it, like the, the role of this U one and U two are different here, so it's, it's but it might be the first. It might be the first second order result of any kind for the for like Martin's bound. At least I'm not aware of any others. Yeah. So so I, I mean we are able to get a second order results, but like. I mean, we believe it is better. I mean, I mean, I, 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 I think, uh, yeah, we, we try to evaluate it, and and we believe it is better than the uh, the result by Yasai at all. Oh, sorry, there is another. So okay. Other, yeah. Like I, yeah, but but we haven't really done a lot of work on evaluating that, so so we don't know how good it is, like how good it is compared to this. But like, but it, it subsumes the result by the the second order result by, yeah, by Yasai at all. I think. Okay. Great. Um, maybe one last quick question. Uh, I don't see any more. Otherwise, I, th I think it's good timing anyway, because it's almost three o'clock. Um, so yeah, thanks a lot again. We, we don't really have <laughs> applause over, uh, over the internet, but yeah, uh, thank you very much. And we'll move on to the uh, regular talks. Thank you very much.